You're now listening to episode 80 of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your source for all things real estate, accounting, and tax. Here, we reveal our secrets that can save you thousands in taxes, streamline your accounting process, and help grow your business. Stay tuned to hear insightful interviews with industry experts, successful real estate investors, and current clients on what strategies they use to grow their business and how they steer clear of Uncle Sam. Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Brandon Hall and Tom Costelli here today with our very own Taylor Brugna, advisory manager here at the Real Estate CPA and active real estate investor. Taylor joined us back on episode 32 and is coincidentally our second returning guest. In his last appearance, we discussed how he built a portfolio of 50 plus units in his 20s and how he analyzes his real estate portfolio. Today, we discuss his journey from 50 plus units to nearly 95 units, how keeping good accounting records can lead to thousands of dollars in tax savings, and accounting tips for real estate investors, including year end closes and reconciliations. We also want to wish everybody a happy holiday season and we'll let you take a break from the Real Estate CPA podcast for the new year. That means we won't have an episode Tuesday, December 31st. But we'll be returning on Tuesday, January 7th with an interview with a very special guest you won't want to miss. Happy holidays, and we'll see you next year. Hey, everyone. I want to let you know that we'll be hosting the first ever Tax and Legal Virtual Summit specifically for real estate investors coming up Saturday, February 29th and Sunday, March 1st. At this event, you'll learn about lucrative tax and asset protection strategies from the top legal and tax experts in the industry. Topics include the real estate professional status, cost segregation studies, 1031 exchanges, self-directed retirement accounts, entity structuring, estate planning, and so much more. Don't miss this incredible event designed to save you thousands in taxes and help protect the assets and wealth you work so hard to build. Head over to www.taxandlegalsummit.com and use promo code RECPA for 50% off your tickets. Again, that's www taxandlegalsummit.com and use promo code RECPA for 50% off your tickets. See you there. But for now, we're going to jump right into today's episode. Taylor, thanks for taking the time to come on the show today. You're now our second returning guest. Could you remind our listeners a little bit about your background and what you do here at the Real Estate CPA? Sure, Tom. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I just wanted to congratulate you guys on the success of the podcast. I'm really glad that it's been able to help a lot of our, our listeners here. But I am an advisory manager here at the Real Estate CPA. Uh, I am a CPA that works with our larger fund clients and some of our syndicates. So any client that has a more complex accounting situation generally runs through me here. And then uh, the real estate investing side, um, I am also a pretty active investor in small to mid-sized multifamily in the Tampa area. Nice, nice. And I remember back uh, back on episode 32, you had came on, you, you kind of gave us a rundown of your story. At that point in time, you were around 50, 60 units, somewhere in that range. Where has your journey taken you since then? Sure. So I had a pretty crazy 2019. Um, I think I started the year with about 40 or 50, and I think I'm going to end with about 95. Uh, I just got eight units under contract actually a few days ago. That's closing right at the end of the year. So uh, really pumped about that. Nice. So you have a few under contract right now. You're around 95. Where does the future hold in store? What's next for the real estate business for you? Yeah. So I feel like most investors have a set goal in mind as far as number of units, uh, cash flow. Um, I do think it's kind of arbitrary to a degree. Um, I really fall in love with the process of like making a building more efficient, uh, a comfortable place to live. And uh, I think I want to stay in this in this class size of kind of four to 12 to 16 unit buildings. If I had to put a number on it or a unit count, I think I want to get another 100 in, in 2020. Uh, it's definitely a lofty goal, but I think as you scale, it becomes easier and easier to I'm acquire at a faster clip. So I'm, I'm excited about 2020. How have your deal economics changed as you scaled your portfolio? I remember you mentioned one time in Slack that you no longer have to, uh, and, and I might be mincing your words, so feel free to correct me, but you said in Slack something about how you don't have to either do as hardcore underwriting or you don't have to underwrite to stringent numbers anymore because you have the scale to... I guess, drive value or say, can you just talk about that? How is, how have your deal economics changed as your portfolio has scaled? 
Sure. So I think there's definitely an economies of scale piece to scaling out a business like this. Just uh, uh, cost of professional services drop, cost of materials and labor drop, renovations, things like that. But I do also think because I am I'm hyper focused into a very local area that I tend to have a good understanding of the economics of a deal before I really have to dig into it. Um, a lot of the buildings are very similar, a uh, similar year of construction, a uh, similar submarket, uh, even down to a few blocks of location. So it, it really has become easier in the sense that I don't have to spend as much time underwriting each deal and I kind of have a good feel. And then as far as cost dropping, just things like talking to suppliers, getting uh, bulk pricing. For example, I work closely with a Home Depot rep on all of my all my renovations and the prices that I get versus the prices on the actual website are substantially different. So things like that are very helpful. And you mentioned that you're laser focused on one geographic location. And you've mentioned this a couple times in Slack too, where a new property will pop up and you know, you'll slack the team saying that you're you're exploring placing an offer on it. And the cool thing is that you own the only comp in the area. So obviously that's a pro, right? What are some cons that you see or are potentially running into and in being so geographically centered or geographically focused? Sure. So I think in the Tampa market specifically, uh, the population growth has been insane. I think the demand for rentals has been really strong the past five or six years. But I do think there is a huge problem with that, that, uh, of course, just putting all your eggs in one basket, if something does uh, go wrong in that area, of course, weather is a a strong risk there too. Um, I make sure I have good insurance, but still, I think concentrating an entire portfolio in one area uh, long term is probably not the best idea. So, I don't know if 2020 it's a goal to expand into a different market. I'm not sure if I'm going to put an arbitrary unit count on it before I want to go somewhere else. But I, I'm just really happy w- with the setup that I have that I'm, I'm really able to work full time, put all my energy into the real estate CPA, and kind of have a system in place that I don't have to do much work to kind of manage the rest of it. So it's really difficult for me to expand somewhere else at this point. I would imagine if you're going to have to expand into a new market, you'd have to learn that market's pricing. The un- you'd have to almost underwrite a lot of properties in that market to get the same feel that you have currently for the place you're at right now. It's kind of like you streamlined the system for yourself, and now you'd have to go and replicate that all again somewhere else. Exactly right. I, I just can't imagine flying down somewhere else, uh, walking neighborhoods, uh, interviewing property managers, interviewing lenders, doing that all again. Uh, it'd be quite the task. But I mean, at some point, I'll be excited to do that. I just don't know when it is. Got it. Got it. So of course, you know, it's, it's always exciting to hear about the investment business. I always say, I think, you know, what you're doing Taylor, is, is, is a big inspiration. I mean, it is exciting. But of course, we do have to get to the accounting side of things at some point. And we you know we understand that you have been going through some major renovations on some of the properties that you currently own. I'm kind of wondering, is from a point of view of a CPA, could you walk us through how keeping good records can lead to tax savings on that side? Yeah, absolutely. So I have acquired these units at a pretty fast rate, and I think because of that, there was some deferred maintenance and capital improvements that really needed to be addressed. And I really made it a goal for 2019 to focus on improving a lot of my existing assets. So I really focused on building out a balance sheet that really a real estate CPA would look at and say, oh, this makes sense for maximum tax deductions. So when you're improving things, and I'm, of, of course, you guys are, are familiar with this, uh, any improvement that has a class life of 20 years or less is eligible for a 100% bonus depreciation. And essentially what that means is that you're able to take a huge deduction in year one. And if you multiply that by your tax rate, it's a fairly substantial savings. So I can give you three examples where a normal investor could miss something like this. But because I have the experience at the real estate CPA that I was able to kind of get some substantial tax savings. So the first one is appliances. So I renovated about 30 units in this year. They all needed a four-piece stainless steel appliance set. So that's about 1500 bucks a unit. If you multiply that out by 30, it's 45 grand. I put that on the balance sheet as improvements, but I made sure that I noted in the account that it's five-year property. And essentially, because five, of course, is less than 20, it's eligible for 100% depreciation. And if you just take a third tax rate to keep it simple, 
that's 15 grand in, in tax savings right there that a, a general CPA or someone that's not focused on tax strategy, mm, it could just throw into improvements and then have to depreciate that over 27 and a half years. So that's the first example. A second example is that uh, on a nine unit a multifamily, the building actually needed a new driveway. The driveway and the kind of it's it's got a driveway running down the center of it and it's a parking lot as well. Uh, it was really cracked up. Uh, it was really bad and it needed all new asphalt. So in a situation like that, being able to identify that it's considered a land improvement and that it's 15 year property. So that $15,000 bill for that driveway was again, able to be hundred percent bonus appreciated uh, five grand in tax savings right there. So the final example that I have as well is I did a renovation uh, pretty much down to the studs on a seven unit building and it needed significant landscaping work. And I wouldn't say it was just landscaping where it was just kind of cleaning up some bushes and things like that. It was taking trees down, almost taking down like a forest on, on, a, on a part of the property. So uh, something like that, again, while it's probably considered an improvement, I think it being a land improvement can also lead to significant tax deductions because again, it's got a 15 year life. Being able to 100% bonus appreciate that was a huge tax deduction for me this year. And uh, being able to take all these expenses in, in year one generated a nice loss for me that I could offset all of my other rental income on stabilized property. So it uh, worked out nicely. Awesome. It's always good to have someone uh, come in here who's applied this knowledge and be able to explain you know, how it's impacted them and what the benefits were. Before we get into some year end stuff, just wanted to ask, you know, what kind of general accounting tips do you have for real estate investors? Sure. So for me, I think the big difference between what makes someone successful with the accounting versus someone that just kind of looks at it as an afterthought is that you're keeping up with it on a proactive basis. So for me, I like to update everything monthly. It keeps every renovation, every project very fresh in my head. And I'm really able to identify any tax savings at that time. I think a lot of a lot of new clients coming into the firm, they look at accounting as an afterthought that's done in January and February. It's very difficult to remember a small renovation that that uh, you were doing in March of the previous year. So that's another thing that I'm I'm always very big on. It's just making sure that you're being consistent with uh, keeping your books up to date. And I think something else is that figure out a way that can really get you access to this and this information very easily. So I like to build out systems that just, for example, I have an accounting Gmail account that automatically forwards all of my receipts that a bookkeeper has access to, that they have access to all this information. There's things like that, that really ultimately, it makes it easier for you to, to get the accounting done each month. Well, it's, it's less stressful. And the goal, of course, is to get financials every, every single month consistently. So things like that are very helpful. How are you using QuickBooks Online and Google Sheets, maybe in your own accounting and also like in adding value to some of our clients? Sure. So Google Sheets is uh, extremely powerful. And uh, I'm not a coding expert by any stretch of the imagination. But there is an integration out there that, that actually automatically links up QuickBooks Online and Google Sheets. And it's something that can be updated as frequently as hourly. So what we've been able to do with some of our clients is that because the data is live updating in Sheets, you're able to actually build a dashboard off of that to track certain things. So if you want to track a certain expense item as a percentage of a revenue, if you want to track your net operating income, if you want to track certain debt on the balance sheet, uh, all of these things can be done pretty much in real time. Uh, as long as QuickBooks is being updated, it'll automatically flow to Google Sheets and it'll automatically flow to your dashboard. So all of that is, it's, it's really groundbreaking in, in just getting the access to information. So the, the fact that QuickBooks can, can automatically link up with, with a G Sheets is fantastic. And the integration, it's, it's fairly inexpensive to run. I, I want to say it's like 20 bucks a month. But if you have a coding background, you also can kind of work with, with uh, Google's API to, to kind of make that work as well. So Nice. Quick question before we, again, before we jump into the, the year end stuff, you know, how long does it take with, with the systems as you had set up? How long does it take? you to to wrap up your books each month like how, how much time do you spend on bookkeeping 
So I don't do all the bookkeeping myself anymore. I used to, and it, and it wouldn't take me more than an hour or two to kind of close everything out for about 50 to 60 units. That being said, I knew every month the exact reports I needed, the exact steps that I would take. And I, I was eventually able to document that in detail and pass it off to somebody else. But after a while, um, the first month is always the hardest. But after a while, you get very used to the steps that you need to take to actually reconcile everything. And also, there's recurring transactions that are quite familiar. And uh, so I, I use QuickBooks Online personally, and uh, Buildium is my property management software. But I set up rules in QuickBooks that certain transactions are categorized certain ways, and every month it's just automatic. So all I really have to do is hit add to my books, and a lot of the bookkeeping is done. So I, I've got it to a nice stage where it doesn't take up much time, but it does take a, a substantial amount of work to actually get to that point for sure. Nice, nice. And that's something that we'd be able to, that's something that if someone was going to work with you on the accounting side, that we'd be able to assist them in setting up at this point? Yeah, yeah, of, of course. I think there's kind of two stages to an accounting engagement with us is that the first one is that it, it's more of the cleanup setup phase to kind of set up the chart of accounts exactly how we want it, set up the system exactly how we want it. And that definitely takes a significant amount of time and thought for each client because every client's business is, is very specific to them, a certain market, certain types of investments. But then after it's set up properly, then you get more into kind of what I was talking about earlier, a monthly maintenance phase where it's just more stabilized. The transactions, the amount of work is very predictable and you start to be able to really recognize what you could automate because it's, it's recurring each month. So. So if I hear you correctly, you're saying that there's kind of two ways in working with us on the accounting side. We can definitely set the system up for you, but then on an ongoing monthly maintenance thing, we can either do it all top to bottom, transactional level work, and the review work, financial reporting work, or we outsource the transactional level work and we just come in as review work. Can you explain who would be a good fit for both of those options? So who's going to be a good fit? Well, what type of client or what type of business is going to be a good fit for somebody or for us to come in and own the process top to bottom. And who's going to be a good fit for us to come in, set the system up, but then plug in a bookkeeper or a team of bookkeepers to handle the day-to-day -day stuff. And we'll just focus on the review. And why is that beneficial to you? Sure. So I think all clients are great fits for the first part of the engagement. And, and that's just the setup, uh, setting up the file for efficiency, setting it up for optimal tax strategy. I think that's something where we could add value to almost every single client. But as you mentioned, the, the monthly ongoing work then becomes a question of how much lower level data entry is there or how much complex accounting work is there in your, in your monthly reconciliations. So for example, a client that might have a ton of single family homes it might just be a lot of data entry that's uh, that's a fairly time consuming. And if we're confident that the system is set up properly, it really makes a lot of sense from a cost perspective to have someone in there that cannot handle data entry effectively. So it could be a bookkeeper, it could be a staff accountant on your team, things like that. And then we just come and review every month and make sure that everything is being reconciled and that our systems are being followed each month. Now, on the other hand, there are clients that also prefer to keep everything, just everything with us to kind of keep it simpler. And while there is a cost to that, I think sometimes a huge benefit of outsourcing is that it's, it's not something that you ever really have to worry about. We have a team of experts in accounting and tax that can be tapped at any time. And sometimes it's worth paying a premium for that if, if it makes sense where the work is not uh, really data entry intensive, or it's very complex on a monthly basis. So there's things like that where it might make sense to have us do all of it. God, God, thanks so much for, for, for explaining that and uh, fleshing that out. And, you know, we, we are approaching year end here. I think this episode is going to air right around uh, the year end. So what kind of tips do you have uh, for our listeners on uh, closing out their books for the year and basically year end closes and reconciliations? Sure, sure. So for any client that I work with or really any set of books that I'm looking at, the two major things I'm focusing on is first is, is a hundred percent of the data actually in the system? And then two is, is it categorized correctly? So if we go back to step one is a hundred percent of the data in the system. How do we accomplish that? How do we ensure that the books are accurate and complete? So 
that really is done with reconciliations. So I typically like to start with cash accounts because most of any business, really real estate or not real estate, there's some interaction with cash one way or another for most transactions. So I'll start with doing bank reconciliations, which essentially just means you take the beginning balance. Now I do this monthly, but just on a, on a yearly scale, you take the beginning balance at, at the end, at the beginning of the year, the ending balance at the end of the year, make sure that all of the transactions will equal that ending balance at the end of the year. Then after all the cash accounts are reconciled, then I'm looking down the list of all non-cash accounts and seeing if there is a way to actually tie it to a piece of supporting evidence that, that I can. So what I'll do is I'll run a trial balance for with any accounting software, which essentially just means a, a, the ending balances of every account in your chart of accounts in your financial system. And I'll say, okay, is this something that I could trace back to a statement? So I'll, I'll give you a few examples. So a loan balance, uh, I could definitely trace a loan balance to a year end statement provided by a lender. If they're holding a reserve for taxes and insurance uh, and the escrow balance, I could definitely tie that out to a loan statement. And so anything that I can reconcile, so I'll start with cash, but then anything else that I can reconcile, I will go ahead and do that. Then I think the second and final step really is that once everything is reconciled, you really need to review the trial balance and say, uh, does this make sense? So let's just say, for example, you've got uh, two rental properties or you have 10 rental properties, excuse me, and they're they're generating $1,000 a month. If you see your rental income is significantly off from $10,000 a month, then there might be an explanation or a reason to look into that particular account. So that question can really be asked, is this reasonable? Does this make sense? You really can go down for every single account on the trial balance and really just make that assessment. Now, certain accounts are going to take an hour. Certain accounts are going to take about 30 seconds. It really depends on how complex the portfolio is and how complex the account system is. But you really should be looking at every single account and assessing for a reasonableness if, 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 it, if it wasn't able to be completely reconciled. And you've, you've found a lot of success with the clients that you're working with. Some are really large clients just by simply going through that process of asking, is this reasonable? Does this make sense? Now, you know, some of the clients that you're working with have portfolios of over thousands of units or thousands of properties. How do you go through it at that sort of scale? And I guess anybody that is out here that is a syndicator or running a fund and they're listening to this episode, how could they potentially look? at whatever it is that their accountants are giving them and ask, is this reasonable? Does this make sense when you're at that level of scale? Sure. So I can give you a perfect example of actually just a year on close that I was just going through with a fairly large client. Um, so I was looking at a subset of, of homes uh, that that I, I was I was starting with rental income. So all the cash accounts were reconciled. I, I generated the trial balance. I went to the income section and I looked at rental income. Uh, it looked a little low, just based on the average rent per per home times the number of homes. So then I thought to myself, well, what could be a reason for the the rental income being low? Because if 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 cash is reconciled, it needs to be something that is not cash. So what wound up happening was that there were a few tenants throughout the year that they actually paid their last month's rent through security deposit. So that's essentially a non-cash transaction because you already received that deposit. It was recorded as a liability, but now we had to transfer the liability to rental income. So there's things like that where every account has some scenario like that where it does take critical thinking and say, well, it's low. Why is it low? It's high. Why is it high? Um, and I really try to be analytical with it because you're right, Brandon, that at certain scale, you can't look at every home. It's impossible, uh, or every unit, or every every building. So what I like to do is kind of look at things in percentages. So just just for example, for a lot of the the uh, multifamily guys out there, uh, I would say ninety nine out of a hundred uh, a stabilized multifamily, the expense ratios in a relation to income is about forty to fifty percent. If it's way outside of that percentage, I know something's wrong, or there must be an explanation. 
So maybe it was a first year of operation, or maybe it was a huge renovation that year, or maybe there was some kind of lawsuit. There's always explanations for things like that, but I'll typically try to take the analytical approach and just kind of look at averages or what the expectations are supposed to be, and then go from there. Nice. A lot of stuff in there for today. Any closing thoughts, any last minute tips you think you'd want to leave with our listeners before we wrap up? Um, the one thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is very important is that now that we're approaching year end, uh, if you are doing your own accounting to make sure that you are getting your information to your CPAs, uh, hopefully that's us <laughs> as, as soon as you can. Um, the longer you wait to kind of do the accounting, like I said, the, the less fresh it is in your mind. And then the, the more stressful tax season comes as well. So it's, it's always good to try to do your, your year end process the first few weeks of January. Great advice. Great advice. But Taylor, thank you so much again for coming on the show. Uh, Always great to hear an update uh, of your story and what you have going on and also the accounting tips you have for our listeners. We'll have to bring you back on uh, once you get that new market up and going and uh, we'll have have another conversation at that point. Uh, Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please find us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also email us at contact at therealestatecpa.com with any feedback or topic suggestions. We are always taking on new clients and with the new tax laws in play, you really don't want to navigate this alone. Let us help you save money on taxes with your accounting and CFO needs. To become a client, navigate to our client page at therealestatecpa.com and fill out a web form with as much detail about your situation as possible. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your week.